Okay, this is the second lecture of two about World War II and African American history. And in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about the war on the home front and the advent of some different kinds of civil rights activities that occurred. More than 1.5 million African Americans left the South during the 1940s, and a million moved from rural to urban areas within the South. What was causing people to migrate? Well, there were uh, economic opportunities that were offered by the war. There were aircraft plants in Oakland, California and Mobile, Alabama. There were car factories in Detroit that were offering African-Americans high paying skilled jobs. And Southern states in contrast had a race-based employment hierarchy that placed African-Americans on the bottom. In 1940, 77% of the total U.S. black population lived in the South, with nearly half in rural areas, and two out of five worked on farms. But by 1950, only 68% still lived in the South. Many migrants filled the vacancies that World War II created in factories. African Americans made up 3% of defense workers in 1942, but by 1944, they made up 8.3%. 25% of these workers worked in foundries and 12% in shipbuilding and steel mills. In 1943, 55,000 of the 450,000 members of the Detroit United Auto Workers were black. And here you see a nice map that shows you some of the major migration routes from southern states to northern states or southern cities from 1940 to 1970. New Deal and war agencies prepared black migrants for northern industrial jobs. Black activists like Paul Dixon championed industrial skills training for African Americans in the South, but the government did not agree until shortly after the war started when the U.S. Employment Service began to supply skilled workers to plants outside the South. In 1942, the War Manpower Commission placed graduates of Xavier University in Louisiana's welding program uh, in ship, shipyards outside Louisiana. Black workers from the Florida War Training Center in Jacksonville were sent to shipyards and airports in places like Chester, Pennsylvania and Bridgeport, Connecticut. Most black migrants went to Chicago, Detroit and other Midwestern cities, but those from Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas and even some East Coast Southerners also found their way to the far West. During the 1940s, the West Coast's black population grew by 33% to 443,000 people. Migrants settled in such metropolises as Seattle, Tacoma, Portland, Vancouver, the San Francisco Bay Area, the Los Angeles, Long Beach area, um, and San Diego. Southern states tried to block this migration by passing laws to entrap black workers. These were called work or jail laws. In uh, Texas, a state law was passed that prohibited recruiters from Michigan from recruiting local African Americans. During the sugarcane harvest season in 1942, New Orleans police arrested blacks under vagrancy laws and forced them to work in the fields or else go to jail. In Georgia in 1943, Police rounded up black men and women and forced them to farm and do domestic work. But migrants were able to use what came to be known as the Underground Railroad, a network of black activists, union representatives, and recruiting agents who helped farm workers find jobs outside the South. Some paid for migrants' transportation out of the South and arranged contracts for them. It's interesting to note that black women migrated first. 60% of African Americans employed in war industries were women, and industries in the North and West gave black women an opportunity to escape low paid labor as domestic servants in other people's houses. All right, now, while in a way the war did offer some economic opportunity, it will not surprise you to hear that discrimination and racial hostility tainted these opportunities. Black women at North American Aviation in Dallas were assigned more labor-intensive jobs than were white women. Blacks who worked at the Lockheed Vega Aircraft Factory in Burbank, California 
endured a racially hostile work site, and white workers in Mobile and New Orleans rioted when black workers were upgraded to higher positions in factories. Part of the problem was that white workers were used to being paid a, quote, racial wage. That is, they were used to being paid more just because they were white, and they were also used to certain categories of jobs being off limits to African Americans. So for the most part, African Americans in factories had only been able to be like janitors, and all of the skilled positions were singled out for white workers. As this changed with the establishment of the Fair Employment Practices Commission that I mentioned the other day, the commission, you know, saying that people could not discriminate against African Americans, uh, white workers struck to protest having their privileges taken away. In 1941, there was a sit-down strike at Detroit's Packard Motor Car Company to protest the promotion of two black workers. A year later, 20,000 white workers at the factory walked off the job and stopped production for almost a week to protest three black promotions. Shortly after that, 350 white workers shut down the Dodge plant when 23 black workers were promoted from unskilled to skilled jobs. Um, in some industries, the existence of the Fair Employment Practices Commission was helpful because it helped employers who did want to hire black workers by giving them something to tell their angry and intransigent white workforce. The federal government is making me desegregate the shop floor, they could say. Unfortunately, the FEPC did not have an enforcement apparatus. The program had a small budget and some politicians didn't support it. In 1943, an editorial titled Open Letter to the President appeared in the NAACP's journal, The Crisis, announcing that Executive Order 8802 is being defied and sabotaged by management and labor alike. On the last couple of slides, I've shown you some African-American women working in war industries. It's interesting to note that the federal government uh, enticed women into the factories by telling them, oh, the kinds of work you're going to do in factories are just extensions of what you do in the home. So if you can use a vacuum cleaner, you can use a riveting gun. If you can sew your family's clothes, you can sew um, airplane wing fabric onto an airplane. There were some unions that supported African-American laborers throughout the war. The Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, led the way. Um, they included such... Uh, unions under them as the National Maritime Union, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, the United Cannery Agricultural Packing and Allied Workers of America, and the United Packing House Workers of America. Union representatives worked with regional FEPCs, African American organizations, and government agencies to advance economic, in, uh, in, advance economic equality. In contrast, the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers is a good example of a union that was not helpful. They excluded African Americans until 1937. Then they changed their policies and created all black auxiliary unions that didn't provide black workers with the same protections that union membership provided to white workers. When African Americans protested these segregated unions, the IBB forced shipyard employers to fire all of their black workers. Hundreds were fired in California and Oregon, including the president of the San Francisco chapter of the NAACP. African-American workers helped themselves by joining the unions that were open to them. By 1943, about 400,000 black workers had joined CIO unions, which secured for them collective bargaining rights, seniority rights, grievance systems to appeal violations of rights, and national representation. All right, so the union movement cuts both ways. The CIO unions much more helpful than some of the other non-CIO independent unions. Competition for jobs in cities fueled tensions and resulted in riots. In Los Angeles, the Zoot Suit riots involved clashes between white sailors and black and Latino civilians. Riots also broke out in San Diego, Detroit, Long Beach, Chicago, and Philadelphia. Philadelphia. 
The most volatile year for riots and racial violence was 1943, when approximately 242 racial battles broke out in 47 cities. One of the worst riots started on June 16, 1943 in Beaumont, Texas, when between 2,000 and 3,000 white workers beat and robbed black pedestrians, overturned cars, and burned African Americans' houses. It was claimed that an African American had raped a white woman, but this was constantly the convenient excuse for any kind of violence against African Americans. It was more likely caused by tensions sparked by the influx of more than 30,000 African American migrants to the area. In Detroit, white workers held massive strikes to protest black workers' promotions and excluded African Americans from moving into federal housing. Violence erupted over rumors that whites had killed a black woman and her baby and that a black man had raped and killed a white woman. 6,000 federal troops were needed to restore peace after the ensuing three-day riot. In that Detroit riot, 34 people died, 675 were injured, 1,900 were arrested, and $2 million in property damage was incurred. All right, so this move into northern cities and into northern factories was not a smooth sailing. It was met by a lot of racial antagonism on the part of white workers who really were the ones picking all the fights here. Um, on the top right of the screen, you can see where lynchings occurred in the 1940s. So they still had not stopped as a result of uh, anything, World War II participation, the Great Depression. Nothing had stopped lynchings from happening. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, part of the Double V campaign meant fighting for civil rights at home. Black people joined the NAACP in record numbers during World War II. In 1940, the organization had 355 branches and a membership of about 55,000 people. By 1946, the organization had 1,073 branches and 450,000 members. The NAACP's growth facilitated the creation of nationwide networks for protests and political campaigns. The Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, was founded in 1942 by a group of pacifist University of Chicago students. These students had studied Gandhi's nonviolent disobedience campaign. I'll be talking more about Mohandas Gandhi in a later lecture, but suffice it to say that he was a native Indian leader who, starting in the 1920s, um, began this tradition of direct action protests um, to get the British to remove their colonial regime from India which they finally did in 1947. So the idea of direct action, that is strikes, um, peaceful protests, kind of making the other side attack you, that all comes out of Gandhi's techniques. CORE in the 1940s targeted lunch counter and restaurant discrimination. Uh, and they provided ordinary people of all ages and backgrounds with an opportunity to participate in a grassroots direct action movement. The group started sit-ins as a form of protest. They had two sit-ins in Chicago restaurants in 1943, and they were treated very, very badly by the people who worked there and by the other patrons. The students were served meat with eggshells in it, sandwiches filled with wet coffee grounds, and had trays of hot food spilled on them. But their methods would be taken up by many other civil rights advocates over the next two decades. We will return to the idea of sit-ins in, in the early 1960s. Black newspapers were also instrumental to the freedom struggle during World War II. Called Soldiers Without Swords, black journalists writing for newspapers such as the Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore Afro-American, the Chicago Defender, and the Norfolk Journal and Guide kept African-Americans informed. African-Americans who stayed in the South continued to suffer disfranchisement and the civil rights organizations decided to target voting exclusion in the 1940s. In 1944, 
the Supreme Court ruled in the case of Smith v. Allwright that the all-white Texas Democratic primary was illegal. Two weeks after the rulings, 36 black delegates representing every southern state met to form the National Progressive Voters League. During the election of 1944, the CIO helped African Americans pay their poll taxes and sent white and black field workers into black areas to get the vote out. Southern Democrats resisted black participation in their party. The Progressive Democratic Party, founded by activists in South Carolina, sent a slate of delegates to the 1944 Democratic National Convention. The organization had 45,000 members by the end of that year. The PDP was aware that its delegates would not be seated, but they wanted to draw attention to the fact that blacks fought in the war but were denied rights at home. Despite this white terrorism, blacks in the South registered to vote and voted in record numbers. The number who voted tripled to 600,000 between the 1940 and the 1946 elections. And NAACP attorneys Thurgood Marshall and William Hasty argued against segregation in bus travel before the Supreme Court. Irene Morgan had refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a bus ride from Virginia to Baltimore. She was arrested, found guilty of disobeying a segregation statute, and fined. But the court ruled in Morgan versus Virginia that segregation in interstate bus travel, that is, between two states, was illegal. Now, it was one thing to say, as the Supreme Court did, that segregation was illegal. It was another to actually find that enforced in practice. And so CORE tested the Morgan versus Virginia ruling in 1947. They sent eight black and eight white people on a bus ride from Washington, D.C., through Virginia, North Carolina, and Kentucky, during which African Americans were seated in front of whites. Several were arrested or dragged off the bus by angry white, I was about to say villagers, by angry white Southerners. The journey of reconciliation was one of many direct action nonviolent campaigns to end segregation, and CORE's method would become the model for the Freedom Rides of the 1960s. This 1947 journey was called the Journey of Reconciliation. Black women in this time period also challenged professional segregation. The black nurse Mabel Stoppers initiated a letter writing campaign against discrimination in the Army and Navy Nursing Corps and later carried her crusade for full integration of black nurses into the broader nursing field. She succeeded. Both armed forces branches began accepting black nurses on an equal basis with whites in 1945, and in 1948, the American Nursing Association eliminated racial restrictions. All right, so this is an example of some of the kinds of civil rights um, organizing activities that people undertook in the 1940s, the other side of the Double V campaign. And one of the greatest victories that occurs in the 40s is the final desegregation of the Army. NAACP President Walter White was telling Harry Truman, who um, succeeded Franklin Roosevelt in office, that a soldier had been beaten and blinded while in uniform in South Carolina because he took too long in the bathroom. Truman supposedly responded, my God, I had no idea it was as terrible as that. We've got to do something. In 1946, Truman appointed the President's Committee on Civil Rights. It had two black members and several prominent white members. And among the committee's goals were fair employment, an anti-lynching law, and the end of segregation and discrimination in the military. Truman issued Executive Order 9981, which declared an end to military discrimination but several years passed before the order was fully implemented. Now, of course, not only are the armed forces completely desegregated, but the armed forces became a real, I don't know, avenue for African-American advancement in the second half of the 20th century. The Servicemen's Readjustment Act, commonly known as the GI Bill, was designed to help veterans complete their college educations, secure home loans, and collect unemployment benefits. In 
While the bill itself didn't discriminate against African Americans, African Americans had higher rates of dishonorable and um, general discharges that barred them from receiving benefits. The Veterans Administration would give black veterans home loans only if they moved to all black neighborhoods. Black veterans were forced to take low paying jobs because they were refused unemployment benefits and segregated white colleges denied admission to most African American applicants. In 1946, for example, only 46 of the 9,000 students enrolled at the University of Pennsylvania were black. All right, so even though Truman issues this executive order desegregating the army, and even though the GI Bill isn't theoretically closed to African Americans, there are all kinds of structural impediments to black people getting a fair shake, either in terms of housing or employment or college admissions. There is also movement to desegregate the culture, the wider culture in the 1940s. Um, I think the participation of large numbers of African Americans in World War II and the subsequent desegregation of the army played a role. Although you guys are going to be reading about Jackie Robinson and the desegregation of baseball. Of course, in 1947, he took the field for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Willie Mays, Ernie Banks, and Hank Aaron also led the integration of baseball. In 1950, Althea Gibson became the first African American to compete in the U.S. Tennis National Championship and went on to become the first black tennis player to compete at Wimbledon. And in 1950, the NBA signed its first black player, Charles Cooper, Chuck Cooper, who was drafted by the Celtics. Racial barriers fell more slowly in football. The American Football League had signed eight black players by 1946, but the National Football League didn't uh, draft a black player until 1949 and didn't regularly play signed black players until the 1960s. So I'm not quite sure why football was slower to integrate than baseball or, um, or basketball. Boxer Joe Lewis won a victory over the German heavyweight Max Schmeling. This made him the pride of the African-American community, really, as well as the whole nation. All right, so sports begin to be desegregated in the 1940s and 1950s. And there are also sources of cultural strength founded in the black community. Writer Frederick O'Neill and actor Abram Hill founded the American Negro Theater in Harlem in 1940 as a way to expand the limited opportunities available to black entertainers. Their theater helped Lena Horne secure roles in Hollywood films, and they offered classes in writing, acting, voice, and speech that were attended by more than 50,000 people between 1940 and 1949. And I was just at the Schomburg Center for the Study of Black Culture, that is what the Harvard branch of the New York Public Library is called, and got to see where the American Negro, Negro Theater is located. It was in that 135th Street Library branch. Finally, because jazz had been kind of culturally appropriated by white people in the 1930s, the story goes that black artists created bebop in the 1940s and 1950s as a form of jazz that was harder for white musicians to actually do. It featured smaller groups, a lot of improvisational soloists, a lot of really um, masterful playing. So um, such people as um, saxophone player Charlie Parker, trumpeter uh, Miles Davis, uh, pianist Thelonious Monk were the ones who launched the bebop music in uh, movement in jazz. All right, so that's quite a long lecture for America's home front in the 1940s. Uh, hit me up in the um, comment section with any questions or um, points of disagreement or other comments. See ya.